A wonderful morning to everyone who has joined today from Manage Engine family. We would like to extend our warm welcome and sincere thanks to all our customers, partners, and users who are interested in our solutions. Endpoint management and security is one of the main focus areas of our Manage Engine. In today's webinar, we will focus on endpoint management solutions, which has different product portfolios under management and security. During today's session, we will be discussing Desktop Central Suite, which has management and security capabilities. Once again, a warm welcome to the Desktop Central training. Let me introduce myself. My name is James, and I'm a product specialist with Manage Engine. I take care of the endpoint management products, including Desktop Central. I'm a seasoned technical support engineer, assisting customers in their implementation, consultation, and troubleshooting in case of any challenges. Let's look at the training schedule. We are on week three and we'll be looking through the asset management for today. This is one of the modules of our endpoint management and security suite. We have covered a couple of modules over the past weeks and we are currently running on week three training. In case if you have missed any of our training schedules, you can always view them on the link that is shown at the bottom of the screen. If you're up interested in the upcoming training, please do use the same link to register yourself. And a good news to all who's uh, participating on this training. We are providing a training participation certificate upon completing the training series successfully. Remember, you have to complete all the uh, training series. Configuration deployment, OS deployment, and tools for troubleshooting, and some other admin functionalities that you do on a daily basis. All modern operating system supports modern management as well. It supports features like geo-tracking, geo-fencing, managing store applications, profile distribution to enforce restriction, operating system reset and recovery. Could you guys guess the popular operating system when I say modern operating system? Yes, it is Windows 10. Windows 10 is a classic example in which we can manage both traditional and modern management. Desktop Central can manage both the world's traditional and modern from a single console. Hence, with Desktop Central Unified Endpoint Management, you will be able to manage desktops, laptops, mobiles and tablets, servers, point of sale devices, and yes, you can manage your browsers as well. Uh, even with this current uh, work from home situation, even browser is considered as a security threat. And all this from a single console, just remember that. Desktop Central is also recognized for best unified endpoint management tool of 2019, as reviewed by our customers in Gartner Peer Insights Customer Choice Award. We are recognized for unified endpoint management in Magic Quadrant for the second consecutive year. We are recognized for both traditional and modern management. Now, these are the features that you can leverage when you're using Desktop Central as a unified endpoint management solution. We have patch management which takes care of operating system and third-party application patching. We have application management, asset management, configurations. In fact, if you're following our training schedule, we will talk about, in this, uh, you know, about this topic in our next sequence. You can manage other functions, including mobile device management for iOS, Androids, Windows, and Chromebooks. Then we have modern management, which is for Windows and Mac machines. 
you can perform things like uh, geo tracking complete or corporate wipe you can even put them on kiosk mode you can distribute store apps and manage profile distribution then we have os deployment where you will be able to create a single master image and deploy it to multiple machines now these are the features that are offered within desktop central suite now let's quickly look at the components used you know to run the desktop central application there are essential as well as optional components the desktop central server is the central component that you will install it provides the interface to the management console the agent is also an essential component you need the agent to be installed on the machines that you would like to manage there is another component called the notification server this is a useful uh, uh, or i would say this is an interesting component that we will talk more about when we dive into the product when we look at the optional components we have a distribution server which serves as a repository for patches software scripts that you have deployed to the machines in a branch office we can create unique replication policies for each location as per your bandwidth requirement then we have the secure gateway server which will act like an additional security layer when you are going to manage an endpoint that is outside your network we also have the failover server in case if you want to have high availability you can make use of this and remember this is a separately licensed add-on moreover you can also use language pack to list the web console in your preferred language now these are the operating systems that we currently support we support windows mac and linux machines and this is the complete list that we support at the moment in case if you have any questions during the training session we have a a, a panelist uh, you can post your questions to the chat so that they can answer your questions and if you have questions after the training our support desk is always open for you guys now as i mentioned agent needs to be installed on all the client machines that you're going to manage so we have multiple options to do that so desktop central is a client so uh, server model now you can install the agent using group policy startup script if you have active directory in place you can simply download the application setup and push it via gpo we do have automatic agent installation directly from the web console you can add multiple domains and choose the machine from those domains and push out the agents we also have scripts that you can use to install the agent alternatively you can download the agent manually and execute the setup directly on the client machine and it should then automatically report back to the server so we will be talking about agent installation in greater detail in our upcoming training session if you're interested please subscribe to the upcoming training now why do enterprise need asset management now as far as you know my experience this could be the reason the one that you're seeing on the screen you would like to track all the softwares and hardware assets in an organization and of course you would like to optimize the usage of software license to be compliant and audit ready at all the times and there should be a detailed report an in-depth report that should cater all your needs whenever you need it now what kind of data is collected during the inventory scan instead of going through the options let me show you the options on the console itself now when you do the agent installation just a second there will be a one time quick scan that happens 
if you enable this setting so under the admin tab if i go to agent settings this there's two options here actions to be performed after agent installation make sure this option is selected perform inventory scanning so this will be a full time scan so during the scan what kind of data are collected let me go back to the inventory here and under the computer section i'm going to choose uh, my machine's name here so during the inventory scan you get the complete uh, system information like the operating system summary service tag serial number expiry date will be automatically fetched disk usage system information like the services which are running on this machine users groups driver details share information hardware detail like what kind of hardware being used whether the hardware is working okay or not software details what kind of software that are currently installed and used store apps metered softwares and if you'd like to uninstall uh, in a, if you find unauthorized application you can have it uninstalled from here too certificate details you're not seeing the certificate information because i haven't enabled the scan you should be able to enable the scan under the scan settings and certificates let me go back here and then you should be able to check the file details security information like whether bit locker is enabled or not if it is enabled you can fetch the recovery key from the console itself antivirus detail whether antivirus is enabled if you're using windows defender or any other third party antivirus whether it is up to date what version it is same goes with firewall whether if you're using windows firewall or any other third party antivirus and usb audit gives you all the details of the usb uh, usage like you know what kind of uh, usb device is being used when was it used when was it uh, connected meaning uh, when was it last used how long they have been using that device uh, even the device instance id will be fetched during the inventory scan itself so these are the details that will be collected during the inventory scan now let's quickly go back to the presentation again now how does the inventory scan works remember i mentioned that during the first agent installation it's going to be a full scan now what happens like you know if there is a new software is installed or new hardware being used uh, you know will the inventory get updated automatically yes it does but it is based on the inventory scan that you schedule on the console let me quickly show that on the console here so under the inventory section you have this option called schedule scan you can configure the scan based on your requirement either daily or weekly or monthly now this schedule is for differential scan let let me quickly take you guys here so the first scan is full scan the next consecutive scans will be differential this is to avoid the data congestion okay i mean if you have like more than 1000 or 2000 machine and if we run full time scan all the time that's a huge data transfer so the next consecutive scans will only be a differential scan all right so scan initiated uh, agent does the scan compares the old and the new scan data and then only the differential data will be sent back to the server now I have a quick scenario to uh, make sure this training is, uh, uh, you know, very useful for you guys. So I have John and his IT team who is responsible for managing the distributed workforce. Now, when it comes to distributed workforce, you know, uh, there are three things that comes up in the mind, which is, you know, the regular users who already have VPN access. So, you know, those users, either they can work from office or they can, you know, connect anywhere within the office and then they can work. And then you have the user, uh, you know, who's working from home with VPN, uh, you know, provided, or VPN access provided. And then you have the users without VPN, but you will be having cloud-based applications, right? Now, there are challenges that every administrator faces when, when it comes to, you know, managing uh, work from home, uh, you know, uh, users. 
important things to be noted down here you know the first thing when, when you're going to enable work from home you know you should be considering the internet bandwidth that they use whether vpn gateway is okay whether all your cloud applications are accessible for the end user and when it comes to managing what if, if it's a new device is it a bring your own device kind of uh, uh, device that you allow the end user to use it or is it an office uh, asset uh, whether you know you have any other collaboration tools that allow the end user to work and apart from all this there's this important thing on the right side which is securing those work from home endpoints how do we secure it you know we make sure that you know the, the machines are completely patched with the latest vulnerability and security patches we'll have to make sure that the data are not leaked so we need a data leak prevention and as I mentioned in the beginning, even browsers are considered to be a, a threat. The reason for that, you know, any extension that the browser uses considered as a threat, and it has permissions to, you know, read, write, and access to your storage. Even quick example, Grammarly. That's one of the commonly used plugins or extensions, I would say, which ha which knows what you write and all the details that you do on your browser. And uh, when, when the device is being, you know, uh, compromised, you need to lock down that endpoint from being, uh, you know, connecting to your work uh, uh, office uh, network. So there's a, a there's a need of endpoint lockdown, and then obviously encryption, either BitLocker encryption or any other third-party encryption that you would like to use. So these are the few challenges that I, you know, uh, come up as per my experience. But you, you guys may have come across many uh, challenges during this COVID-19 situation when you have a workforce working from home. Now, through Desktop Central, how to identify and manage work from home endpoints. So first thing is to identify work from home endpoints. Now, SGS simply means secure gateway server. Remember one of the uh, optional component that I referred uh, a secure gateway server which acts like a security layer between your desktop central server and the endpoints that are going to, you know, work from home, or I would say work from, uh, work through internet, you know, instead of connecting to your local LAN. Now, when it comes to LAN agents, uh, say there's two type of scenarios, okay? Say you have the desktop central right now, uh, and you already have the secure gateway server installed. Uh, now, before we dive into this, let me quickly give you a, a simple example on how the agent reaches the server agent reaches the server in three address this is in a sequence okay first the agent will try to reach the host name of the server machine second it tries to reach the server using the local ip third you need a public address if you're going to manage an endpoint outside your network which is the secondary address so always the sequence host name local ip and then the secondary address at least one address should be reachable okay uh, either the host name or local ip or the secondary address if one address is reachable if you change the other two addresses it will also be automatically updated on the agent side now remember this sequence okay now if the secure gateway server is already configured and you have the machine in your lamp obviously your host name and local ip should resolve so there will be no issues and if you have users outside your network, uh, and again, you have the public address defined and you have the secure gateway server an additional security layer there. So then again, uh, you can simply manage them as roaming users. Uh, how do I manage them as roaming users? Let me quickly take you guys back to the console here. So when you create your branch office, you just have to create a branch office with direct communication, that's it. Uh, you just have to you know, name it as roaming users or any name that you want and choose direct communication and have a default replication policy uh, you know the 24 hours format like 24 7 unlimited data transfer now uh, this will uh, you know uh, this will be uh, useful for the agent to reach the server remember if i choose roaming user obviously your host name and local ip would fail but the secondary address would be reachable and again you should be able to manage that endpoint now so even if it's a remote office or roaming users you will have no issues when you have secure gateway server configured now let's say you have uh, the desktop central installed uh, you have no idea what secure gateway server is and you are planning to get it now if you're going to implement secure gateway server to you know manage an endpoint uh, which is not in your network 
the, the end user are already working from home. Now, the agent only knows the host name and local IP, right? It doesn't know the secure, uh, or, or sorry, the secondary address. Now, how do I update the secondary address? Uh, we do have a script available with us. Uh, let me take you guys to the console here. So we have articles uh, and scripts that are available with us. You can download the script uh, from the console itself. You can either, uh, I mean, Remember, uh, if the a agent machine is not in the LAN or it's not in your control, uh, the agent will not get this address automatically. It's, it's a responsibility to the admin to run the script uh, to update the secondary address to the agent manually. Okay, just remember this point. Let me take you guys back to the console here. Uh, at the end of our training session, uh, if you need instructions or if you need a link, uh for that article uh, you can even post your question on the chat and you will get that link okay now how do i identify a work from home endpoint if it's connecting through a distribution server now in the same article we do have a query that allows you to do it and uh you know you know in order to save time i've already uh done that and i've captured the screen recording for you guys let me quickly play that for you okay and then i will explain now i would like to find out uh, the uh, endpoints that are connecting via distribution server. So in the article, uh, we have a query uh, that is available. You can see the query uh, uh, which I'm going to highlight right now. So you just have to copy the query and paste it on a notepad. And right now you need the current millisecond. You can, it's very easy to get the current milliseconds. You can simply go to Google and then type in, you know, current milliseconds time, you will get it. Just copy that time. And you have to subtract the current value with the value that I'm gonna highlight here. Just copy that uh, current milliseconds that you capture from uh, Google and then minus it uh, with the value that we have in our query and take the result number and then paste it over the uh, uh, script. Make sure you remove the commas after you know you get the exact numbers. Right, it's gonna take a few more seconds. Hope this is useful. Same thing, just get the exact value, remove all the comma signs so that you know you get the exact results you want. And then copy the script, go back to the console. There is a tab called reports. Under the report query. So I'm gonna copy the script right now and then I'll go back to the console. So reports and then query report, new query. And then in here, just name it. Uh, say work from home with the distribution server. A anything that you want. And then run the report. So if it is going to connect via distribution server, under the branch office name, you will find the remote office name. Now, this is how you identify the endpoints that are communicating via distribution server. And the same report can be exported as CSV or PDF based on your requirement. Now, let me uh, show you uh, the directly connecting uh, endpoints, like how to identify the directly connecting endpoints to my desktop central server. Now, again, uh, you have a script available with us. Before even running the script, uh, sorry, the, the query, uh, you have to run a configuration with the predefined script that we already have. And you know you have to mention that configure uh, that particular configuration name which i will show you in a minute so go to that query again same reports and then uh, query report uh, i'm going to name this as direct comms check and then i'm going to paste that query here so under that config name i've already used my configuration module to deploy a script and you have to make sure this script is executed where where will i get the script in the same article guys all right, 
make sure that the status shows as x unit then just copy the name go back to the query and then remove that config name and then paste that query name that uh, sorry the configuration name that you use and then run the report it will give you a value whether uh, i mean it's like a true or false value if it's going to communicate via uh, a distribution server then obviously it's going to say false if it's not then it will give you true uh, value all right now this is how you identify an endpoint if it's connecting via distribution server or through direct comms okay hope this is useful if you have any questions please use our uh, uh, chat window to get your answers all right let me take you guys back to the console here so how do i proactively resolve hard disk space issue now guys this is something that every administrator would want to know like you know will will we get a notification if the hardware uh, sorry the hard disk size goes uh, beyond the limit that we want then under the same desktop central console under the inventory tab you have this option called configure alerts in here you have the option called disk space in here you can mention the overall disk space uh, usage limit once the limit crosses uh, you know you can get an email alert triggered to you automatically and uh, what does that email co uh, consist so the email will, will have these information like the device name uh, where the device is located either uh, on a branch office who is the currently logged on user domain name disk partition capacity all that details right now let's say um you know uh, there are um, unwanted files in the disk and i would like to clean up right how do i do that so we have these tools and in here we have this option called system tools that allows you to do the uh, disk management you can do the disk fragmenter or you can do the disk cleanup so in the disk cleanup remember uh, you know after windows feature pack 1703 there is this new concept called storage sense which cleans up everything automatically guys all you gotta do is just select this option below 1703 you have the disk cleanup utility where you have to select everything manually here so in here you have the capability to you know remove all the unwanted files uh, using this single task itself all right as i said uh, you know you can get alerts whenever the disk space goes higher than what you uh, uh, you know uh, get and if you'd like to get uh, more information uh, on which devices uh, you know uh, has more disk usage in the uh, inventory module itself we have a canned report uh, that you can make use of you can go to the inventory report here and then you have computer by disk usage you can make use of this report as well all right same can be exported as a pdf csv or xls and once you get the report what would be the next thing removing unwanted files using the tools option now the next scenario managing software license uh, for this uh, training session, I've taken 7-Zip as an example. Now, how do I manage licenses through Desktop Central? Let me put this up front with you guys. Desktop Central does not validate the license, meaning it does not show you or uh, it won't show you whether the license is, you know, uh, 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 is purchased like from a properly, uh, properly from a vendor. Uh, if it's a valid license or if it's a pirated one no it does not going to show you that what it's going to give you it, it's going to give you a workaround uh, to uh, get a difference in count um, by entering the number of license you purchased and then the number of network installation all right let me let me take you guys back to the console here so if i go here under the inventory manage license and I can add the license information here. I can choose the software. And uh, you know, I, I can choose the software name here. And then I, I can simply mention the number of license purchased. So for example, uh, I've already created the seven zip and I've uh, mentioned, uh, you know, saying that I have purchased 50 licenses. Currently I have, uh, uh, you know, three machines which has this particular software installed. So basically it gives you a difference in count based on total purchase and then number of network installation if it's you know within the uh, limit then it will show you over license and it will be blue in color 
if it's equal like 50 out of 50 then it will be green in color if it goes below the percentage uh, of the total percentage i mean the, the the total purchase license count then it will be showing you know it, it will be shown uh, as red in color and if you'd like to get an alert uh, you can also configure the same under the configure alerts here like a license usage limit right and there's one more uh, question that you may ask uh, what if if i have multiple versions of the same software installed on multiple machines now we do have the option to group your software together uh, i mean different versions together so that this does not duplicate uh, the, the number of network installations so you can go to the uh, group software add group software here uh, which i've already added i'm going to edit the same thing and i can search for 7zip here and then i can get the version details and i can promote one of the version let's say the latest version the recent version which is installed in your network set set that as a parent and then you have this option add the following version 7zip like you know after the one that you set as parent will be automatically added to this group so uh, even if a new version comes into the picture like you know gets installed in your network you don't have to come back here and add that it will be automatically added to this group and in, when you add the license you can simply add the group itself instead of you know selecting the uh, specific version whatever the group that you created it will be listed for you right so now this is how you manage the license effectively and as I said, remember guys, this is just a workaround to, uh, to give you number of network installation and then a difference in count based on number of uh, license that you purchased. I mean, the count that you entered while creating this rule. Right? Let's quickly go back to the presentation again. All right. Now, let's say um, I would like to prohibit a software or I would say there are unauthorized applications that we don't want the end user to use it. Uh, we have this option called um, prohibit software, which allows you, uh, let me do this and take you guys back to the console again. Prohibit software. And then in here, you have the option to enter that same example. I'm gonna choose this 7-zip as prohibited software and then I save it. Even if it has different version, choose the group itself. And again, it's gonna give you the number of machines that has this application installed. And if you would like to automatically uninstall them, you can configure the policy right here. And if you'd like to show the end user that this is an unauthorized application, maybe your own customized message, then you can use user notification setting here, and then you can put your own message. And within this notification, user does have an option to request it. Let me show you a screenshot here. So this is the notification that appears on the end user side when they install uh, a prohibited software. I mean, the software that you listed as prohibited. Now, they can you know, put their email address, their uh, manager's email address and the purpose for uh, using that application and send that request to you. That request will be shown to you on the console itself under this tab, under the user request. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have that moment uh, at this moment, but under the uh, I'm really sorry that I do not have a real-time example. Um, but under the action tab, you have an option called approve or deny. If you say, you know, if you find that a reason is a valid uh, reason, then you can approve it. The end user, you know, they can continue to use the application. If you deny them, it gets automatically uninstalled based on your auto uninstallation policy. Right. Now, this way you can uh, prohibit the software. And apart from this, we have this new security add-on called application control. This application control gives you an option to even uh, have a whitelist software and a blacklist software, um, meaning like an approved uh, set of softwares. Uh, say for example, in my organization, only 20 softwares are approved. Apart from these 20 softwares, the end user should not install any application. It should be blocked. How do I achieve this? I can simply go to this application control, application groups. I can create a whitelist here, and you can create this list based on product name or even vendor. Say, for example, I'm going to love all the Adobe and then Casper Sky, and then I'm going to say Cisco like that. Or, sorry, excuse me. Or you can go with product name, or you can use the uh, executable, 
uh, which, which again, you don't have to manually enter it. This will be automatically fetched by the agent. But if you want to uh, you know, manually add an executable, you have this add button right here. Even a file hash or a folder path. And then you, you can simply create this rule first. Once this rule is created, you can apply this policy to a group of uh, uh, computers or all the computers group, meaning we have a default custom group. In Desktop Central, you have the ability to create multiple groups based on computers or users. Let me duplicate this page real quick. So you can go to admin tab here, custom group, and you can create your own group here, right? And we have the default group called all computers group, meaning all the computers that has an agent installed, or you can go based on uh, uh, the group that you wanted, either like sales team, marketing, IT, contractors, etc. You know, you can create your own groups and then associate that particular uh, approved software list. And in here, you basically have two modes. One is the audit mode. The other one is the strict mode. Um, there is something called gray listed applications as well. I'll give you an example again. Same example, 20 approved softwares only, but you know you have the desktop central just now and you are distributing this policy to all the computers, which already has some other application. Say the end user has 25 applications, only 25 are approved, sorry, 20 are approved. Now those five applications, right? We call them as gray listed application, which is already there uh, before uh, applying the policy. Now, if I choose strict mode, it's gonna allow the end user to use only those 20 applications even the gray listed application will be blocked. They won't even be able to, you know, uh, run a portable EXE, you know, for the EXE that they have in their USB stick or a portable hard drive. But if you use audit mode, it's going to allow them to use those 20 approved software along with the existing five gray listed application as well. So you can go based on uh, your requirement again. So if you wanna have a strict mode, enable the strict mode so the end user won't be able to use any other application apart from what you approve or go to audit mode, allow them to use you know, the existing application. Or you do have the privilege management. If you have, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. So you can simply go to the modify option. Say, uh, you know, these particular softwares, uh, you know, uh, it's okay for the end user to use it. You can just simply just create them and have this under the privilege list, right? now. The application control and prohibit software allows you to effectively manage what kind of software is being installed and what needs to be uninstalled automatically and you know block it even when they uh, even install it on their machine. All right. Hope this is useful. Uh, guys, if you have any question, I repeat this again. Kindly use our uh, chat window. All right. Let me take you guys back to the presentation again. All right. Uh, let's quickly look at the desktop central architecture. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, desktop central is a client server model application. And desktop central is available as on premise solution. You can have the desktop central hosted in any Windows operating system. Now, this architecture talks about both the LAN as well as wide area network. Now, you can manage multiple branches from a single console. Remember the remote office option I mentioned earlier. They can connect either over the internet or you know they can use VPN or even if you have MPLS tunnel, that would be fine. The machines that are present in the remote office, uh, you know, which are connected over direct internet connection, you can use the secure gateway component. Remember that will act like a security layer as you see here. All right. So consider this is within your network, right? This is your firewall and you have the desktop central server installed. You can do a, a sync with your active directory. You can access the console anywhere within the network and you can manage your endpoint within your LAN. Now, in order to manage an endpoint outside your network, obviously you need the secondary address. Just remember that point. And, you know, I can, I can simply do a NAT here in this firewall saying that, you know, uh, say, for example, uh, your public address, say product.server.com. I can do a NAT saying any traffic goes to product.server.com on port number 443 should get redirected to the local IP of my desktop central server. But that's like exposing the server, right? Uh, though we have two factor authentication, 
we do support SAML authentication for single sign on. We do have a security layer there. However, if you feel that I need one more security layer, I'm not going to expose my server. You can have the secure gateway server. So instead of doing a NAT here, I can place a, a, a server machine. Uh, it doesn't have to be a server. Uh, it, it can even be a Windows 10 machine. So this machine can be placed under the DMZ with the secure gateway server installed. And I can do a NAT here saying any traffic that goes to product.server.com on port number 443 should get routed to my local address of secure gateway server. Secure gateway server, when you configure it, you will be entering all the information about the desktop central server. So it does know how to reach the desktop central server. So this guy is going to validate the communication that are going to come outside your network, and then it then routes it to the desktop central server. Now, do we support closed network? Yes, we do. Now, what is a closed network? A network which does not have a connectivity to internet, or I would say limited connectivity, right? Now, even if you have a closed network architecture, you still can use Desktop Central to manage all your endpoints. Desktop Central is available in AWS Marketplace and even in Azure in case if you're looking to host the desktop central solution on the cloud. And we do have our own Zova cloud. Desktop central is available in our own cloud platform itself. If you would like to you know, subscribe and do a trial, there's a link at the bottom of the screen. Just visit that link and you should be able to subscribe it. Now, 90 minutes refresh policy. Now, why do I need this? And what is this 90 minutes refresh policy? Desktop Central can scale small as well as large networks, okay, using this 90 minutes refresh policy. Every agent communicates with the Desktop Central server once in 90 minutes. Even if you have 90 machines or 900 or even 9,000 machines, this 90 minutes will be divided between them and each machine will be given a specific time to talk with the server. The server has the intelligence to assign a time for each client to talk to the server. And this is to avoid network congestion or bandwidth related issues. So the 90 minutes reference policy is designed in such a way that the load to the server will be split evenly, all right? Now, what are the ports used by Desktop Central? Desktop Central runs primarily on two ports, 8383, which is HTTPS or 8020, which is HTTP for local connections. All the agents talk to the server using this port. There's another port 8027, which is TCP. This is used by the notification server. Now, I mentioned in the beginning that this is an interesting component. Uh, you know, why do we need a notification server? If you are going to have a solution which is client server, you don't want the connection to happen or you don't want the server to publish the content. You would want the agent to connect back to the server to collect the data. The same way Desktop Central is also uh, created, meaning uh, all the communications are inbound to the server only. All the data will be collected by the agent either during the 90 minutes policy. Now, what if, if it's a, a, an on-demand action? Say I wanna deploy a software right away, or I would like to perform a remote control. I have to choose a machine and then I click on connect. That's something that I do from the console. Or even if I have to do a manual inventory scan, you know, I, I'm triggering something on the con server console. You know, how does the agent know? Now, for, for that purpose, for the on-demand action, we use this notification server and it uses the 8027 port number. This uh, eventually, you know, um, resets the agent timer, and it, 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 it's like, you know, in a simple term, it's going to tell the agent, hey, you have something on the server, come and collect it, like that. It's going to reset that, agent immediately comes back to the server, gets the information, and then it processes that on the client uh, machine. So remember, it's always inbound to the server. If you do an on-demand action, again, it's an inbound to the server, but using the notification server, we will trigger the agent to come and collect the information from the server itself. Hope this information is useful. All right. Apart from these two ports, there are other optional ports that you need to open. Uh, the important ports are listed on the screen for you guys. Uh, you can keep the respective ports open as per your requirement. 
there are few other posts as well uh, you can view them using the link that is shown at the bottom of the screen this will give you a better idea about the posts that are required to have the uh, you know desktop central solution set up now some scenarios and solutions first scenario we also use service desk plus for asset management how do the two products interact if we are i mean if we are collecting inventory in desktop central do we still need to scan the computers in sdp first question first answer uh, you do have the capability to integrate your service desk plus uh, let me show you that setting here under the console if you go to admin under the integration you can go here and then you can choose service desk plus and then you know you can integrate these two solution using the api keys that are available on each console all right you can get the keys now once it is integrated service desk plus will use the desktop central agent to collect the data so you don't have to do the inventory scan for managed devices remember managed devices meaning a machine that has an agent installed service desk plus has the capability to find all the network uh, devices um, but desktop central is going to give you the asset details of managed devices only now so to answer the first question you can integrate using api and you don't have to uh, do the scan on the service desk plus uh, uh, if if it's a managed device desktop central agent does the scan and the scan result will be posted to the service desk plus next question how can we identify the security status of the machines in my network i hope you you guys remember this option that i showed you in the beginning about the security status if you go to inventory and then computer you have to select a computer name and then under the security tab you will find both the bit locker as well as antivirus information and if you'd like to fetch this as a report uh, a single report that shows you everything we have a canned report here under the inventory reports if you go to antivirus details you can simply check the status here whether it's enabled or disabled um, right here and same goes with bit locker too uh, you can go to the inventory inventory reports and then bit locker detail you can find that details from here too does the prohibit software feature blocks web browser plugins as well no the answer is no uh, web browser plugins or extension cannot be blocked using prohibit software however we have this uh, security add on browser security plus uh, you, which allows you to manage your uh, browsers like chrome firefox internet explorer ie you can manage uh, the plugins and extensions uh, you can have uh, uh, you know an approved list of domains uh, web list white listing or um, you know you know you can prohibit uh, unwanted website visits like all that right next the scenario shared directories with write access is a security threat can we identify them you certainly can so you can go to the uh, inventory again you can check each machine one by one if needed you can go to the computer section and then under the system tab you have the share option you can do it right here or you can also use this share detail can report this will show you uh, the, the the shares that are created on this uh, uh, client machines and uh, what kind of permission it has next scenario i want to identify the computers with local administrator accounts is this possible yes it is so let me again take you guys back to the console here so under the same inventory report we have this scan report called system group users in here you can just select the domain or the work group that you would like to uh, you know so I'm going to choose local account and then equal. And then in here, I can choose the administrators. And then I can generate the report. This is going to fetch me the report right here. All right. So you certainly can identify the administrators. Now, the next question, you know, I have some administrators which I do not want them in my network. I, I would like to remove them. How do I do that? Using the configuration and then Windows, you have this option called user management. Using this, you can either uh, remove a user or modify the existing user. Like, you know, you can move that user to a user profile rather than, you know, a member of administrator. All right. 
Next scenario, Dropbox is installed at the user level, and I would like to get the list of computers that have it. How do I identify it? Same uh, option again, we have a CAN report. Let me show you guys here, inventory. Inventory report. And then user specific software. You can use this report to get uh, the list of software that are installed uh, based on the users. I want to attach an invoice or other attachments to the computer to maintain records. Is, is this possible with asset management? Yes, certainly. So in the console, if I go to computer tab here, I have an option here which says, uh, you know, custom field. I can add a custom field with a format called file upload or true or false or numbers or alphanumeric. Since I'm going to need a, a file upload to upload my invoices, I'm going to choose file upload and then I can add it, right? Once I add this, you can find an option here. I've already added that uh, as an invoice uh, tab. So I can simply click on browse and add the invoice that I wanted to upload here. So the next, all right. Now we are at the frequently asked questions window. First one, can we add the date that computers have been purchased? Now this is to register the warranty date. You certainly can, but it is not required uh, because these details will be automatically fetched. Again, if you go to the uh, computer tab again here and click the computer name, you can see the service tag and the, you know, the expiry date will be automatically fetched. But you certainly have the option here bulk update, sorry, not the bulk update. Here you have the pencil icon, and in here you can enter the expiry date and shipping date. However, if you do it manually, the automatic fetching will be uh, disabled. I mean, as soon as you edit this field, this will be automatically disabled, all right? The next question would be, when you add a new program to a private software list, does it take all the versions of the software into account? Remember, the group software that I mentioned, if if it's a sim single version that you select under the prohibit software list, then it is going to stick with that per version only. But if you want all the versions of the same software should be prohibited, then add them under the group software, like inventory tab, manage license, group software tab, and then you know group all the versions into a single group. And when you add the prohibit software list, add them, uh, uh, add the group that you create. Next question. In case of any issues with the driver in a machine, how can, how, how can I identify the same? So uh, we do fetch the driver details as soon as you install the agent. Driver detail will also be fetched. So it's available under the system and driver. And you should be able to see all the drivers used on this machine if, if there is a driver which is not working, which will be shown here. And we do provide a, a KB article which will have the resolution steps. Next question. Oh, that's it. So I hope my training was useful for you guys to understand the basic uh, concepts of uh, asset management, uh, how to fetch uh, you know, the uh, hardware details, software detail, um, how to prohibit an application. Uh, or, you know, I hope this session is useful. Please do rate my presentation. If you like my presentation, please do rate on a scale of one to five, where five is the best. And if you'd like to spread a word about uh, Desktop Central, you can use the social media platforms. You can use Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Uh, the hashtags are on the screen itself. And the next training will be on uh, February 24th on remote control. You can see the timings here. So for GMD, it's 6.30, and for ADD, it's going to be 11.30, all right? And if you'd like to know more about Desktop Central, and if you'd like to uh, you know, have a personalized demo, uh, please use the link at the bottom. It's a tiny URL. Uh, you can get a personalized demo from us. Uh, it's gonna be an online demo, okay? So I'm gonna keep this for a minute. And thank you so much for your valuable time during this training session. Um, you guys have a wonderful day and stay safe.